racking up to a thousand dollars a month seasonal workers and those who've had their EI run out so for weeks now we have we've looked to the Prime Minister for policy we've looked to our medical officers of health for the facts on the health side of this pandemic and for the economic side we look to our governor of the Bank of Canada Stephen Polos to help guide us he joins me now no pressure governor after that yeah. introduction but you know it is definitely a sign of the changing times that we're having a video chat today um, yeah. but let's let's start with the morning announcement interest rates are at 0 0.25 no change there is it even possible to lower them and, and what would the impact of that be well Lisa it's technically possible we've seen other countries use negative interest rates uh, so we know that that is in our toolkit but uh, we've made a decision that that causes too many distortions in the financial system and it really wouldn't have the kind of effect you might think it would have, especially at a time when the economy is all locked down. It's not like a lower interest rate helps you go out and spend uh, later today. Uh, this is really just preparing the ground for the recovery period, which mm. will come next. Well, you know, it almost sounds like you're saying predictions are, are out the window in a sense, that math is not, is not possible to predict right now. It's almost the case. You just heard the Prime Minister uh, talk about uh, how long it may be before we can allow the economy to begin to re-engage. Uh, that's the key uncertainty with making a forecast. If I knew the date when uh, those restrictions would be lifted or maybe the, the path at which or the pace at which they would be lifted, then I think we could do a, a credible job of uh, creating a recovery scenario. But what's crucial about all this is not the contraction itself, which of course is hard on everyone. It is how do we feel about it during it? And uh, this is where the fiscal response is so important. Uh, what the fiscal response is intended to do is to put a floor under our confidence. Uh, it's taking care of those basic needs and especially the 75% wage subsidy program. That keeps employees connected to their company so that when we do re-engage the economy, their recovery can be very swift. You don't have to go out and rehire people or search for people. They're already there. These ingredients should make for a very robust recovery when the time is right. And that's the big question, though. When the time is right, nobody really has, a, has as you say, there's no date on a calendar. And the, the confidence level of Canadians is shrinking as fast as, as uh, you know, our, uh, our economy, a record 9% in March. Is there anything else that you feel maybe if we are looking at many, many, many months and months of this that, that is left to cushion it for Canadians? Well, uh, let's, the, the worst case scenarios are many, many, many months, as you mm. say. Um, I think that the, in our monetary policy report this morning, we outlined not forecasts, but two scenarios. And uh, the positive scenario, which I would describe, given where we are today, as roughly a, a best case scenario, what that would show would be this summer we start re-engaging, and it takes a few steps to get everybody back re-engaged. But by a year later, the economy is right where, more or less, where it would have been if this hadn't happened. Uh, I think that that scenario is within reach for us. Mm. Again, I think if we continue to observe the social distancing and don't delay that, if we, if by, by, by not obey, obeying the rules, we could delay that recovery period. I think that's the most important ingredient. That sounds like very optimistic. So, uh, because we're, we're hearing that this is considered the worst economic earthquake since the Great Depression. Most of us rely on history books to, to comprehend mm -hmm. what that really means, how long that really lasted. Um, do you share that comparison or do you think it's, it's too much? I think the comparison uh, uh, fosters a, a vision like you just described, which is quite inappropriate. Uh, what we have here is not a behavioral recession, uh, which is normal. Uh, the, what we have is an exogenous thing that happened to everybody. And the policies that we put in place are intended to essentially stop the clock for how long it takes for us to get the, get things under control. And we then we can go about our business, perhaps in a, a more restricted way than normal, but we go about our business. Restarting the clock then means everybody is just in hibernation for that period, and then the economy then re-engages and we have a, a smart recovery. It takes a while to get back to where we were, of course. But I think that that is well within reach. Calling it uh, or 
putting comparisons with the Depression is very misleading because that was a 10-year event. And we know the causes, we understand them well. And the most important thing was policymakers did very little mm. uh, to offset the blow to people. Uh, in fact, you know, the Central Bank of Canada wasn't even created until 1935. So uh, what we have today is all the tools of both fiscal policy and monetary policy fully engaged uh, precisely because we do read the history books. Mm -hmm. And okay, so you're basically saying that comparison to the Great Depression is just a great headline and we should really look within for the fact that this is a different world than the one of the 1930s. But I'm sure your own family is asking you, everybody must be asking you, you know, what do we need to mentally prepare for and what advice do you give them? Well, I think we need to be mentally prepared for this continuation of social distancing, uh, that I think the economy will, will function where a much lower percentage of the people who used to go to work every day, uh, physically go to work every day, like, like the way you and I are working now, has become the norm across a lot of, uh, a lot of professionals in the economy. So I think that that is going to be a different, a different world we live in. I think, uh, given this morning, I did a G20 meeting that took place in Riyadh. Uh, you know, uh, the idea that I would hop on a plane for a whole day in order to attend a three or four hour meeting, I think those, those kinds of things are gone. Uh, so there, there's going to be a different world, but I think we need to be prepared for uh, accepting some of those realities. And if we do, I think we can adapt to them. People are incredibly innovative in the way they adapt to these things. Uh, you can never underestimate the, the energy, which is entrepreneurial and in workers, uh, to, get, to get things done despite obstacles. You know, that is absolutely one of the silver linings in this, the innovation, the creativity, the invention that is forced on us at this time. And, and there is obviously a hope that that will continue. But you talk about, you know, real world and yesterday, the Bank of Canada put out that press release I thought was so interesting, encouraging mm. retailers to continue accepting cash. So what's the backstory on that? Or are there stores that are unwilling to take physical money right now? So there are examples in the economy where people are, are refusing to accept cash. We're receiving a flow of information from people on the ground around that. And I'd like to discourage, uh, discourage merchants from that policy. I think it's great that merchants are, are encouraging touchless transactions. So if you've got one of those cards and you don't have to touch anything, then that's good. But our currency is made of plastic. It's, uh, it doesn't have any more germs on it than any other surface that you, that you touch. Of course, after you touch money, you'd wash your hands just as you would after when you leave work, you touch the doorknob. Uh, that, that, I think, is, is the level. And there's a lot of people in the economy who rely on cash to do their transactions. They are unbanked or they're barely banked. And uh, I think it, it should be the case that, that that legal tender remains legal tender. If that's what's offered, I think a merchant should be accepting it. And then, of course, using their hand sanitizer afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. I mean, that's across the board on that one, the hand washing. But your your mandate as, as bank governor ends on, on June the 2nd. And I mean, you've got to wonder, is this really the right time to have someone else take over, in your opinion? Well, the, the governor's uh, term is a seven-year term. So, uh, and you know, therefore, when it's coming for quite a long time. And that's why that we invest so much in, uh, in succession planning here at the bank. We have an excellent team, a really strong team with deep experience. Uh, the, le the, the level you see often is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and we have a very, a very deep team. I just happen to be the, the fellow that's lucky enough to have the C on his jersey. Uh, the rest of the team has, has got different experience at the table, and that's how we work. So I don't, I don't see myself as particularly special in that sense, Lisa, and we plan well for that succession. I think uh, the bank is much bigger than one person. And the process to choose my successor has been ongoing since around late December, and it's virtually 90% complete, and I think it would be unusual to interrupt that process 
we're, we've got this thing. Well, we are in living in unusual times, but this is certainly not the way you would have wanted to end such a successful run. And, and I wonder, you know, when did you actually see the penny drop? You're a man who did not want to use the word even recession, and now we're talking depression. So when did you see the penny drop that, the, that we were moving into this crisis? Well, I guess it would be about uh, the second week of March. Oh. Uh, where things really started to uh, to take hold. I mean, when we were in February, we began to think about scenarios uh, that uh, that could happen. Uh, but I think I think the more important point uh, to come back to is we are experiencing a highly unusual contraction, and I still don't like to use the recession word, and of course not the D word that you <laughs> mentioned a couple of times, because recession is is substantially behavioral. A recession happens because people uh, begin to feel unconfident, they spend less money, companies have to lay off workers, that causes even more people to spend less money. That's a cumulative, dynamic process. There's no reason for us to go into a prolonged recession here. What is happening is we're stopping the clock, uh, make, asking people just to stay home and not, not do anything special, and then we're going to restart the clock. That is not comparable to any recession I've experienced, and certainly not uh, the depression that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not even close. So I think uh, that we put all that platform in place. The government has put a floor under everybody. When we, uh, when we come out of there and start to uh, re-engage the economy, the economy is going to respond very quickly to that. Well, we hold on to your optimism, Governor Polos, and we thank you for your service during this difficult time. If I don't get a chance to talk to you again before the end of your term, uh, we wish you strength also. Thank you very much, Lisa, and to you. Take care.